our freedom, our sense of being able to really be at home, to feel at ease, is inextricably all connected. We are all impacted by suffering that exists in the world. How do we hold that? And how can we come together um, to find ways to be able to transform it? My talk is on the question, are we wired for compassion? The field of neuroscience and psychology have been looking into this question for the past couple of decades. We're actually finding that not only does it seem like we're wired for compassion, but we actually have a bias built in for compassion. So my talk is on shifting conversations here in the United States about Israelis and Palestinians. Why do we have compassion for the people that we do? And who is missing from those conversations about compassion? Who's not being talked about in a compassionate way? Who's not being presented in an empathetic light? And why is that? When we talk about the pandemic, what we're actually talking about is the trauma. It's grief. Maybe it's new for us, but not so new for a lot of communities, right? There's a kind of resiliency that I talk about. There's a resiliency, an emotional resiliency that we have to train. And that emotional resiliency is really about connecting to um, sources of support. When we can first begin to really sense and feel ourselves as being recipients of care, that really helps us to begin to connect with our own capacities to feel care for others. Very recently, some researchers at Princeton University actually found that if you think about removing pain or lessening that person's suffering, you actually get reward centers lighting up in your brain. You're hardwired for this, but there are certain things you can do to train it. So my talk will have a sprinkling of different types of practices that you can do and things that you might not be thinking of as compassion training. So going to the homeless shelter, for example, and giving some of your time, that's a compassion training. I came across a poem in Arabic called Rivers, and it took me a while, and then I realized that's Langston Hughes, written in Arabic. Palestinians everywhere have found a deep resonance with the experiences of Black Americans. So part of my research has been uncovering that history, and I'm excited to share it with the Downtown Lecture Series audience. If our hearts can't open, we can't transform, we can't evolve, right? And this is both individual work and collective work. When something becomes collective, then we begin to see huge shifts in systems that are perpetually uh, harmed folks. Having an experience of, of compassion and experience of being cared for is really imperative for many of us right now. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is JP Jones, and I'm the Don Bennett Moon Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Arizona. And it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here live and live streaming to the concluding lecture in our 2021 Downtown Lecture Series on Compassion. Last week, we heard a moving and profound talk by Dr. Maha Nasser on uh, the geopolitics of compassion and how we can approach it through individual and communal stories. And tonight's speaker uh, is a Buddhist teacher, and uh, his name is Lama Rod Owens. And um, I want to give a special thanks to Leslie Langbert, who was the first speaker in our series. Uh, the director of SBS's Center for Compassion Studies for facilitating uh, his invitation. Uh, before I introduce uh, Lama Rod, I would um, like to make a, a word of thanks to our uh, sponsors. Uh, first, to our series sponsor, uh, the Stonewall Foundation Fund, and special th shout out to uh, Rick and Bill and Kathleen Small. 
I'd also like to thank our um, supporting sponsors, Mike and Beth Kasser and Haluloa Companies and Tucson Medical Center. And our community sponsors, Roy Medina and Rowen Aguirre Medina and Joanne Ellison and Dr. Barbara Starrett. And finally, our sponsors, Tiana and Jeff Ronstadt and our media sponsor, Tucson Lifestyle. I'd also like to give a big uh, uh, shout out to um, Bonnie Schock of this marvelous theater and all the people here uh, at the Fox Theater. Give everyone a big hand, please. Thank you. <clears throat> I hope our sponsors will be back next year, and I hope that you will wait just a minute after our lecture tonight uh, for a special sneak preview of next year's lecture series topic. It's my great pleasure to introduce Lama Rod Owens, an author, an activist, a teacher, and an authorized Lama or Buddhist teacher from the Kagu uh, School of Tibetan Buddhism. He received his Master's in Divinity with a specialization in Buddhist studies from Harvard Divinity School, a self-proclaimed uh, black male queer from the Deep South. His forceful teachings, in part, he attributes to the strength of the community from which he came and the church within which he grew up and with uh, where, and where his um, mother still practices as a member of the clergy. These teachings have been described as deeply authentic and in the tradition of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Lama Rod co-authored in 2016 a celebrated book, Radical Dharma, and just last year he published Love and Rage, which became a Los Angeles Times bestseller. In it, he describes how we can confront systematic racism and structural violence by mobilizing the power of metabolized rage as a force for liberation. That work has been described as personal, honest, courageous, political, and importantly, practical. It's also been described as a Bible of kindness. Lama Rod teaches, conducts workshops, and holds retreats all over the world. And we are especially thankful that he has agreed to join us here in Tucson, Arizona. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Lama Rod Owens. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming out um, tonight. I know you have so many other things to do on a Wednesday night. I wouldn't say that I would come and see me on any evening, even if it was free. <laughs> but here we are, so I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm really excited to be asked to, to hold the space with you all tonight, um, compassion is one of the most important things, if not the most important thing we need to be talking about right now. But it's, it's not always compassion about other people, it's compassion for ourselves, first and foremost. Right? I see a radical Dharma person out there, ha, to represent. <laughs> But before I begin, I just want to thank the university for inviting me here um, to JP for that wonderful, there you are, <laughs> for that wonderful introduction um, to Leslie um, for hosting me and taking me around to Stephanie, wherever she is, for, um, for taking us out today and just being um, with us as we explored the land. I know some of you may be longtime residents, um, natives of um, Tucson, 
And maybe what I'm about to tell you, you already know, but I just want to express to you how powerful this land is. You know, how deeply entrenched in wisdom this land is, and it hasn't been impacted by these centuries of colonial violence and settler culture. The land is still alive. The land is still wise. And as we move through this period of what I call the apocalypse, we're going to be returning to the land. We're going to be returning to indigenous cultures that took care of this land well before many of our ancestors arrived. And many of you may be descendants of the indigenous people of this land. For us to survive this period that we're moving through, we have to call back into the world, back into our bodies, compassion, radical compassion. And we have to remember the land, the earth is under us, that the earth is holding us, that the earth is always loving us. If we can just touch the earth again and remember, it doesn't, it, it sounds easy, but it's actually one of the hardest things <laughs> that we can do because so many of us are so disconnected from the land. Because we're so disconnected from our bodies. You know, many of us struggle in an experience of disembodiment because our bodies house us and hold so much trauma. Right, this trauma that occurs from systematic oppression and abuse. You know, the trauma that occurs because we have survived so much harm. And the body holds the pain, the body keeps the record of what we've survived. And to return back to the body means that we have to undergo a healing of the body. And one of the ways that we do that is to deeply embrace the radical path of compassion. So I know that's a lot to say, and I almost kind of think that like I'm through for the night. <laughs> you have enough, right? Um, but before we continue, it's just a few things I wanted to mention. First of all, I get confused about a lot of things, but particularly tonight, I get confused because I have on my cute outfit, my really good shoes, I'm on a stage and a spotlight, and sometimes I will lapse into being a comedian. <laughs> you know, not the David Chappelle kind of comedian. I'm being, <laughs> quite honestly, a kind of humor that no one ever gets. But it's really funny to me, so you'll never know, actually. <laughs> so if it sounds funny, go ahead and laugh. Like, I'm not going to be offended. I will rejoice because, you know, I will think your sense of humor is wonderful. You know, um, but mostly my sense of humor, you know, really is, that, you know, it, it, it's not timed well. You know, as the crew today, you know, can um, attest to, I kind of rolled in with a few jokes. It didn't go over well. It was about one of your senators here in Arizona. Uh, I think it's too early. <laughs> um, I think we're all just like a little overwhelmed by everything. So I'll just skip that. You know, and I'll also skip everything I had about the McCain's. So, so having said that, um, I want to, before we really get into this talk, I just, I just need to just acknowledge, you know, when I talk about compassion, for me, compassion is so much about remembering, you know, and when we forget, that's when real violence starts to happen, when we forget what's happening, when we forget what has happened, when you forget the history of the land, right? Things start to happen that just perpetuate the systematic violence, right? And so first and foremost, I want to remember, acknowledge the indigenous communities of this land, right? The communities that we know, also the communities that quite frankly lived on this land that we have no record of all inhabitants of this land who left their mark on this land, who took care of this land, whose spirits are still connected to this land. We remember. So, and just for a moment, I invite you just to, in just a brief meditation, just thinking about the land, thinking about where we're sitting. 
thinking about the lives of the people who were here centuries ago. And maybe as you're thinking, just allowing the space for whatever arises, whatever grief arises. Because when I think about the land and what it survived, there's grief that arises for me, there's hurt. And we don't have to do anything right now, but just acknowledge it. So much of, 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 of the practice of compassion is acknowledging the hurt. The hurt of others, the hurt of the land. But first, we also acknowledge the, our hurt. So remembering. And I also invite you to offer gratitude for the land, to be grateful, to be appreciative. Some of us just go through our days and we don't ever think about gratitude. We're just, we get caught up in the overwhelm, the intensity, the politics of struggle, of surviving. For those of you who are students, you know, moving through classes in a pandemic, you know, it's a lot. You know, and I'm sure University of Arizona is charging you quite a bit. <laughs> so there's that. So there's a lot. And you can acknowledge that. It's a lot. It's a lot. And not to mention those of us who are surviving all kinds of issues in our lives. Death, sickness. All the lives we've lost to this pandemic. All the ways we struggle to take care of ourselves and our families and our friends. to acknowledge that and to say, you know what, it's okay. You know why it's okay? First and foremost, because I am not the only one who's struggling. Everyone in this room, everyone tuning in on the video, we're all struggling. We don't sit and do that contemplation enough. I'm struggling, we're struggling. If you close down and get isolated, that's when the suffering deepens for us. Because isolation creates this narrative that like I'm the only one in the world going through this and so therefore I'm bad, I'm wrong, I've done something to deserve this. And no, actually you haven't done anything except to be born human in a world where this is part of what we do is to move through discomfort. And then within the Buddhist lens, not only are we moving through discomfort, we're trying to transcend discomfort. We're trying to transcend and touch who we really are, which isn't the suffering, which isn't the chaos, it's not the trauma. You are not the trauma. You're not the guilt, right? You're not the sum of all your bad choices. You're not your addictions. You're not none of that. To remember, or maybe to even contemplate for the first time that I am already awakened. And I just have to remember that. I have to start divesting from the chaos, from the suffering, and start investing in my wisdom, in my kindness, in my spaciousness, instead of the sense of being shut down and contracted all the time. And I just also want to remember the ancestors, you know, because without my ancestors, I wouldn't be here. And some of you may say, ah, oh, you know, my ancestors created so much harm and so much violence, right? My ancestors are the reason we have to do land acknowledgments, <laughs> right? But not all of your ancestors were bad. You know, you don't come from an ancestry of evil. You know? So when I say remember the ancestors, remember the ones who were really struggling to do what was right. And you may not know who they are, 
but you are the recipients of that kindness, of that compassion, as I am. So we remember those who've come before us and we remember that we have this opportunity to make different choices. We have all that information now to do the work of freeing the land, freeing our communities from violence. So we don't have an excuse anymore. So again, remembering gratitude, feeling this energy of gratitude, just begin to awaken somewhere in your experience, in your mind, in your body. And once you feel that, I want you to give it away. I want you to share it with the earth. I want you to share it with your ancestors. I want you to share it with the person sitting next to you. I want you to share it with your professor who you can't stand. <laughs> or with a dean that you can't stand. <laughs> You're not grateful for them, but it's the energy of gratitude that you're just sharing, this energy of just openness and space. Because sometimes people show up in a difficult way because they're struggling to be well, and it may not even be about you. You know, someone yells at you on the street, is it really about you, or is it that person doing the best they can with what's happening with them in their life? And you never know. You know. We make so many assumptions about people. And people make assumptions about us. But there's a compassion that begins to arise in that moment when we say, you know what? I wonder what's really happening with this person. I wonder what's happening with my partner. I wonder what's happening with my roommate. I wonder what's happening with this professor. I wonder what's happening with this person at the shop who was just really rude. Is it about me? I'm just sharing it. I don't know who you are, but I'm sure you need this energy, this positive energy, because I need it. So thank you, everyone, for this opening practice with me. And I love to lead us through practices because I can just sit and talk for hours, but, but what's the practice? You know, what do we take out of here? You know, what are the tools that I can offer you that can help you actually deepen this compassion for yourself? So, I've been talking a lot about compassion, maybe I should define it. <laughs> and so, as JP mentioned, I, am, um, I come from, well, Buddhism. I come from the practice and the study of Buddhism, Buddhism, particularly the Tibetan tradition of Buddhism. And when I came into my practice about 20 years ago, I was an activist. Um, I was in my early 20s, I was pissed off, I was hurt, I was depressed. You know, I wanted to topple all these systems, particularly racism and war and the military and the police, and I was doing everything that I could to do that. But it became harder for me to function as I moved into my mid-20s. And so I started really looking for ways for medicine, actually, for methods of healing, because I knew that I was not sustainable anymore, because I knew that anger and the frustration would not help me to, to be sustainable into the future. So long story short, I found my way into meditation. And in meditation, what we're actually doing is looking to our minds. We're trying to develop an awareness of our minds and our bodies. That's really all we're doing. You know? We're not trying to get happy. We're not <laughs> you know, trying to be efficient. We're trying to first and foremost know who and what we are. And of course, meditation is the tool and the technology we use to start paying attention. And it's hard, 
because there are so many parts of who we are that we don't want to deal with, and we bypass it. As I often say that if we bypass our work, then we become work for other people, as some of you know. So some, some of you partners are shaking your head. You're like, yeah, I know I live with one. I live with a workload right here. Um, <laughs> And so if I was committed to community change and, and community uplift and healing, then I had to start being committed to what I felt was the source of so much violence around me, which was my mind. You know, so I began this practice of meditation and early on learned about compassion. And what I learned early on was that compassion was this wish, this desire for everyone to be free from suffering. Now, that doesn't mean that I have to like you, right? It's not about liking someone, it's about recognizing that they deserve to be free. Because I recognize that I deserve to be free. And we have to get over that. We have to get over that obstacle of saying, you know what, I can't wish anything for you until you're less of a pain. No, people are often pains because they're suffering. Right? So to wait for you to, to be less of a problem is probably not going to work. But maybe if I can get involved and start wishing and start saying, you know what, I, I really want you to work through this trauma. I really want there to be medicine for you. And then that begins something really profound. But it's not just about other people. It's first and foremost about ourselves. So as we're wishing other people to be free from suffering, we have to begin with ourselves. And again, that's the hardest part of this. When we say, I want to be free from this. I don't even say want anymore. I actually say, I need to be free. I need to be free from this trauma. I need to be free from these memories. I need to be free from the PTSD. I need to be free from the fear and the paranoia. Like, I need this. And you begin with that basic aspiration for yourself. And from that basic aspiration for yourself, then that becomes a source from which you draw upon to start wishing for others to be free. I can't want you to be free if I don't want to be free from myself. If I'm doing that work without working on myself, then it becomes performative. And performative compassion actually is one of the most violent things that we can do because people will believe that you want them to be free, but you actually don't. Or on the other hand, you know, another big issue is that the work that I do for myself around compassion is a source of energy that compels me to wish others to be free. And if I don't have that source of energy for myself, I will be limited. I will not be sustainable. I won't be fluid. I won't be flexible. And then those people who rely on you will get really disappointed. You know, when you hit your limit and you realize, I just don't have anything for myself and therefore I don't have anything for you anymore. And then you shut down you fall apart because you haven't done the work for yourself. But again, first and foremost, we're doing this work for ourselves. I am wishing myself. And it doesn't mean that like we just get to a place where, you know, I'm just full of compassion for myself. No, it becomes a process, you know. I mean, we're full of a lot of things, obviously, <laughs> but obviously, but it's a process that I have to continually return to. Every day in my practice, I wake up and I say, I need to be free from this, right? But wait, because it gets better. <laughs> so not only is this a wish and an aspiration, it also has to become action. This is an actionable process that I'm wishing, and I'll, I'm also beginning to work. And I ask myself, okay, what can I do to liberate people? You know, and some of you love to help by ordering people around. You start becoming the managers of people's lives. 
and saying, you know what, this is what you need to do. You know, like, I saw what happened, and like, can I give you some notes about what went down? You know, if you were just like me, then you wouldn't have that problem, like, you know. You know, that's not helpful. <laughs> you know, and I often say, okay, let's get involved, let's get actionable, but actually for me, unless you ask me for help, I probably won't be giving it, you know, particularly in the form of advice, right? I wait and ask, because I can just get, you know, preachy. <laughs> um, that's a quote from my friends. Um, but instead, my method is to embody what this looks like. Let people see what compassion for self is. Because seeing is actually believing, to use that cliche, but it actually is very accurate for me. I need to see you, because everyone talks a good game. You know, you can go on TV, you go, you know, hop onto YouTube, social media, and there's a whole bunch of people like me, you know, maybe not as realized, but there's a whole bunch of people like me who are trying to sell you something about their spiritual game, about what you need to do, what you need to read, what you need to chant, what you need to meditate on. And that's wonderful, and I love that, but let me see you in process. You know, show me what it looks like for someone to come up to you and yell at you. And I want to see how you respond. You know? That's what I want to see, and that's the teaching. I promise you, I've done this in public, where I've had interactions, and I've kind of navigated it through this lens, and people have come up to me and said, okay, what did you do? You know? So let people see it, but that's the hardest work, to become compassion, to become this deep ethical care for self and the world, right? So yeah, you can listen to people, you can follow people's teachings, but you want to see people do this. And when you see someone do this, to really embody this compassion, in a real way they become your teacher. And truly, actually. When I see someone do something that I aspire to do well, they become my teacher, even if I haven't met them. You know? Taking your teachers, acknowledging the teachers around you who are doing this practice already will help you progress along this path. So, actionable compassion, or what sometimes we say, compassion in action. So it's, it's not, you know, it's, yes, yeah, partially about intervening, disrupting violence that's happening in the world, but it's also a grander, larger thing. It's about how do we begin to disrupt systematic violence, right? How do we get involved? How do we create change? You know, of course, always, first and foremost, we have to start with ourselves. You know, I mean, like you, like many of you, sometimes I'll walk around and talk about how intense the world is and like the world is really messed up. And I have to stop and say, you know what? I am the world, right? Like the world isn't some separate thing that's, that's, that's over there. No, I'm, I am the world. I'm a part of the world. The things that I'm struggling with in the world are the things that are being expressed from me sometimes, the anger, the resentments, the jealousy, the hate, those are expressions that sometimes come from me. And if I want to change the world, I need to change my heart, right? And we've had great, great leaders come along to teach us how to do that. Even some of the most radical revolutionary leaders have been quite loving, quite compassionate. You know? So the project of social change, of systematic change, begins with us. It begins with us acknowledging our own pain, our confusion, our bias, you know, our confusion, our disillusionment, wherever it may be. So you're telling yourself the truth, right? That yeah, maybe I was 
born into whiteness, conditioned as a white person, now there's a systematic whiteness that I have to disrupt because it's not my job to do that. But part of my, but my job is actually as a cisgender male is to actually disrupt patriarchy because I am invested in that system. I was born into that system and I have to tell the truth of how I've been conditioned to perpetuate the system. For the rest of us who are cisgender, how do we perpetuate the binary and create violence in that perpetuating of the binary? And it goes on and on, <laughs> right? We all have multiple identity locations. Some of these locations carry privilege, right? And some of these don't, or not as much. If you want to create change, start telling the truth. Yeah. Yes, I was born into a certain system, and yes, yeah, maybe I hold these racist views, or transphobic views, or ableist views, or ageist views. You know, from some of you older folks in here, you know what ageism is. <laughs> you know? Or views around, you know, gender and identity, you know, it's just, it goes on and on, but like you tell yourself the truth and when you tell yourself the truth in this way, your heart will break. And you're not doing it wrong, you're actually doing it right because you're coming into relationship with the actuality of things. Yeah, this is happening, this is a real thing that's happening. And if I don't let my heart break, then I won't be able to really bring about the change that I need to bring about. There are so many people in the world performing goodness, and they're talking a real good game about being anti-racist and anti-capitalist and this and that. Again, I ask, well, show me. You know, show me what disrupting systems of violence looks like. You know, and don't talk about reading a book. You know, don't talk about posting on social media, but what are you doing? What are the conversations you're having? You know, are you going back to your family, to where you grew up, and having these conversations? You know, what kind of trainings and communities are you investing in that are offering you the tools to make this lifelong work? Because this isn't a two-week project. It's not a five-year project. This is the rest of your life no matter how long you have. No matter if you're just born, you will be doing this work for the rest of your life. Can you commit to that? And again, going, coming back to the compassion, compassion is what drives us, what motivates us to do this work because I am moved by the suffering of the world. I don't wanna suffer. Why would anyone else wanna suffer? And if I'm a part of the system that's creating suffering for people, then I am ethically mandated to do something. We just don't sit around and say, you know, well, fuck it. <laughs> you know, let the young people do it. You know, I'm actually old enough to say that now. <laughs> you know, let the 20 year olds do it. I did it. I did it when I was 20. It's their job now. No, it's a commitment to a lifelong struggle. And that struggle begins to define the quality of our lives. We will be able to die and say, you know what, I did what I could. I did what I could, because I cared. You know, there's a tradition in, in Buddhism called the Bodhisattva tradition. I'm actually, my next book, which is coming out in 2023, is actually about the Bodhisattva uh, tradition. And in, in Buddhism, the Bodhisattva is like a spiritual saint, right? It's a saint, you know, but sometimes it's, the tradition is understood to be about um, like spiritual warriorship, you know? But for me, it's, I actually often describe it as sainthood, you know, and it's a kind of sainthood that says within this tradition that says that, or rather a person says that I will not achieve enlightenment until all beings are awakened, 
right? And not only that, whatever I do is going to be dedicated to the disrupting of violence for all beings. Everything, even every breath that I breathe is dedicated to the freedom of all beings. To get that intentional, I wake up, and my waking up is dedicated to the freedom of everyone. My eating is dedicated to the freedom of everyone. My meditation, my spiritual practice, everything is dedicated. Your whole life as a bodhisattva, as the saint, begins to be oriented towards the well-being of all beings. And as you're doing that, right, you're also moving into a state of well-being, a state of realization. Because again, you know, everything that you're wishing for the world, you're wishing for yourself. And not only are you wishing it, you're doing it. Right? So as the bodhisattva, the saint, is working for the liberation of all beings, that person is doing the work, the labor for themselves to get free. Because the bodhisattva, the saint, can't actually free anyone unless they're free. Right? So it's like someone's drowning, right? And you can't swim but you feel very moved. So you're gonna jump into the water to save them and probably both of you are gonna go down. So the, the heart of the Bodhisattva tradition says that I can't help you until I help myself. And if I can help myself, then I have something to give you. You know, if I learn how to swim, I'm ready to come and get you from the water, right? If I have achieve this deep awareness of my mind and body, then this is wisdom that I can offer you. Because if we're not doing the work for ourselves, then we're just like, well, we're talking shit. We're talking a good game, and you're just gonna create a much more violence for people, much more harm. Because you're leading people down a road that you actually haven't explored, you actually have no idea about. You know? So in this Bodhisattva tradition, you know, we, you know, the tradition says that, okay, the saint will not achieve enlightenment until everyone's enlightened. Well, actually, that doesn't make sense. Because you, as someone dedicated to the path of awakening, you're going to get there. Right? But the, this motivation, this intention that everyone's going to get free before me actually drives you to the end of the path. And it drives you because you begin to lose the sense of, well, you actually, you start confronting the hopelessness of the situation. To say that all beings are going to get free before me, well, that's a lot. I'm not talking about just humans, right? When I say beings, I mean animals. I mean spirits, you know. And just to keep going, I mean, in Buddhism, the cosmology of all the worlds, all the planets, countless beings, all the insects, <laughs> right? Which is countless, right? The Bodhisattva says that I'm gonna get everyone free. And then you realize, oh my God, how is that possible? But then you go a little further and say, it doesn't matter. I'm not interested in agendas and goals. I'm just gonna do the work. That's important for us right now because so many of you are agenda-oriented. You know, you need deliverables. You have deadlines, right? The spiritual path isn't an agenda. Compassion isn't something you put on a meeting outline. Compassion has to become who and what you are. And you lose yourself in the aspiration. You lose yourself. You forget that this is hopeless, and you just do it. And when you lose yourself in compassion, you become compassion. And you become the person that you admire, the person that we all read about. You become a Dr. King, right? You know, you become, you know, a number. Now, if I, I, if I name my people, then you're gonna be like, oh. <laughs> you know? But you become the person you've idolized, the person you've said, oh, I can't never, I can't ever be like that person. I can't ever be like Jesus, you know? That's already the first problem. You believe that you can't, when in fact, a great being like Jesus came into this world to actually show you that a human can, 
So letting go of that and saying, I'm just going to be calm. I don't care if this is hopeless. I don't care if people look at me and say, what are you doing? Why, why do you give a shit? That person voted for such and such. You know, that person didn't take the vaccine. That person, whatever. That person shops at Walmart instead of Target. You know, that's, that's my edge with people because I have a criticism. But, um, like, people are going to say, why do you care? And then you start saying, you know, because I don't have a choice anymore. Right? Because I want all of us to be free and safe and happy. No excuses. But again, I have to re-emphasize that to do this, you have to confront your own discomfort, your own suffering. You have to go into the dark place. Not into the good place, the dark place, (laughs) which wasn't good, actually, you know. Um, (laughs) You have to go into the darkness and you have to start having compassion for the darkness itself. For all the things that we refuse to name for ourselves, for all the mistakes that we've made. For all the things that we wish that we can just take back. All the ways we've hurt people, the ways that we've hurt ourselves. We have to go into that and even wish those experiences to wish that those experiences themselves were free, to be free from being here. You know? It remains because we don't know how to let go, we don't know how to forgive ourselves, we don't know how to give rise to the sense of compassion that says, I deserve to be free from this. I can't keep replaying this. I can't keep going through this over and over again. I deserve to be free. No matter what I did, I deserve to be beyond this. I often say that this also requires a love of everything, right? So when I say love everything, I say that like you have to develop an aspiration and intention or an attitude rather to let everything be there. Like you can't change anything until you admit that it's there. You can't keep saying, you know what, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think racism is a big deal, but I guess I'll be an anti-racist. <laughs> you know, or the climate, you know, you know, it's like, oh, like, you know, I don't believe, you know, anything's happening, you know. But you have to develop this practice of allowing everything to be there, because if I don't let it be there, then I can't change it, you know? It's like I'm trying to walk, right? I'm trying to walk, right? And when, when I walk, right, I'll just show you because I need to get up because my butt hurts. Um, <laughs> compassion for self, this is where it begins. <laughs> so I'm walking, my feet are touching the floor, I'm making contact with the stage and I'm walking, right? But what if I was hovering? a foot over the ground. I don't think I would be going anywhere. (laughs) And this is what I mean about our acceptance of reality. We're hovering above reality. We're hovering above the earth thinking that we're gonna change the world and we haven't even developed the courage to touch the world, to actually touch the ground, to touch the chaos, to touch the sadness, right? To touch the heartbreak. We, We just keep this distance. And from this instance, we say, okay, hey, change. You know, the world stopped getting warmer. (laughs) And you start fanning like that, you know. But for real change to happen, I embody this compassion that draws me close to the discomfort of those around me, to the world itself. And when I touch the world, that's when I can start changing the world. But before I touch the world, I've done the work for myself. That actually allows me to draw closer. I am touching the heartbreak of racial violence. I'm touching the heartbreak of of famine and starvation. I'm touching the heartbreak of this pandemic. 
to move into relationship with the pain, to hold space for the pain. And when I say hold space, to acknowledge it and to let it be there. Yes, this is hard. And I'm not the only one doing this work. That's the radical quality of real compassion is that I have to acknowledge pain. And from a Buddhist perspective, which is a contemplative tradition, not only do I acknowledge it, I have to experience it. I have to know what this feels like. You know, and we say, you know what, I'm not gonna survive this. If I touch this, I can't go back to that trauma, I won't survive this trauma. But from the perspective of Dharma, it's we call in first the resources that we need to do this work. So whatever you need to touch the heartbreak, just ask for it. What do you need? You know, and for me, I need to be surrounded by beings who love me. Right? And that doesn't mean physical beings. I mean, I'm surrounded by beings, deities, ancestors, spirits, the land itself, and I'm calling in that loving energy, and I'm saying, please hold me, because I have to allow my heart to break. Because things will never change until I begin to experience this. And if I don't experience it, then I become work for other people. And then other people are beginning to hold the labor of trying to take care of me when I'm not taking care of myself. And no one actually can ultimately experience your heartbreak for you. Right? There's this fundamental heartbreak that we experience when we begin to understand the nature of the world. That the world isn't, well, that the world is actually quite intense. That there are levels of violence and darkness that I cannot fathom. And some of you have experienced that. Some of you have seen things. You survived things. But for the rest of us, telling the truth about the nature of what's happening, about what's really going on, and allowing your heart to break and to say, you know what? I experienced this because I want all of us to be free. And this is also what I call emotional labor. This is the labor that we're doing for ourselves, working through our emotions, experiencing our emotions, developing emotional maturity, right? So I know what I'm experiencing. I know what I'm reacting to, right? And that's a really hard compassion. You know, it's a really hard compassion for ourselves to say, you know what, I have to experience this. And no matter how painful it is, this is absolutely necessary. And I do this work, like I do this work every day. Every day I'm doing emotional labor. I'm doing the work of compassion for myself. And when I'm going through really difficult situations, right, I'm doing a lot of intense emotional work, I step back and I say, you know what? This work is part of the healing for myself, but it's also part of the healing for everyone else around me because it's not just about me. Again, the Bodhisattva tradition says that everything that I do can free others. You know? So just taking a moment, we're right at time, actually. You know, but as we close up the next two minutes, just taking just a few moments just to, to first, again, just acknowledge your discomfort. Maybe for the first time, acknowledging something you've never been able to acknowledge for yourself. Some pain, some discomfort. And once you've touched that, turn your attention outward to maybe people in the audience and say, you know what, maybe others around me are experiencing this too. Maybe they've survived this thing that I'm struggling with.
this is really important because this is the moment that our heart opens. And it's not just about me, it's about everyone, a shared experience. I start belonging to a community of people who are struggling to get free. I'm not alone. Of course, when you're ready, turn your attention back to yourself. And I want you to tell yourself, I don't want to experience this anymore. I'm tired. I am tired of this narrative. I'm tired of these memories. I'm tired of not knowing what to do to stop something that I've been invested in. And once you make that statement, again, turning your attention outward and saying, I bet others in this space, if not everyone, wants to be free. And then after that statement, coming back to your own experience and saying, may I be free from this and mean it. May I be free. And once you've made that aspiration for yourself, turning your attention outward and saying, may every single person in this room be free from their suffering. May every single being in this world be free. And then if you can practice that and make that a practice, then you can go back out into the work, into the movement of work, into the organizing, into the activism, and start crafting your activism, aligning your activism, not with hate and aversion, but from this place of compassion that I'm doing this, I just want us to be free. I'm not trying to get back at you. I'm not trying to hurt you in the way that I feel like I've been hurt. I'm just trying to get everyone free. And I don't have to like you. I don't have to know you for you to be free because you're just like me. You want to be free, you want to avoid suffering, and you want to be happy. That's humanity. So thank you so much for your time and your attention. Um, On behalf of everyone gathered here, I just want to dedicate this time, this space, this energy, whatever benefit that we've all experienced, I dedicate it out to all beings, to all people who weren't able to be here, who weren't able to join the streaming. So I dedicate this energy, this positive energy to the liberation of everyone and everything. May we all be free as quickly as possible. Thank you all so much for your practice. Uh, thank you, Lama Rod Owens. Uh, profound and, uh, and, and beautiful talk. Um, I'd like to close by uh, thanking the teams from SBS who made all this possible, and that includes uh, the team in marketing and communication, and SBS tech, and development, and business and finance, and not last, uh, my colleague Maribel Alvarez. Uh, Associate Dean of Community and Community Engagement. Um, thank you to all the speakers and thanks to the audiences uh, who have been with us uh, on this uh, month-long journey. Um, I'm uh, I'm sad to say that this is the um, last time that I will be on the stage uh, as part of the Downtown Lecture Series, uh, but we are ensuring that there is a tenth year. <laughs> Uh, because we do have to start in advance of the naming of a, of a new leader of the college. And so um, we've gone ahead and selected a next year's topic 
uh, for whoever that person might be. <laughs> and it's, uh, I think you're going to really enjoy it. And um, hopefully in a post-pandemic year, uh, we will once again fill every seat in the house because the topic is... It's biological, yes, and precise, and we know a lot about how it all works. But it is also intensely social and cultural and personal, and we will draw uh, on our faculty uh, to give you insights about sex and sexualities next year. Thank you all for your support for SBS and for um, uh, looking forward, as I will, uh, to next year's lecture series. Thank you. Thank you.